So it didn't start with the idea of, of making products. It started the idea of how can we improve well-being for the people that we're connecting with. That's the voice of Jared Schlaff. He runs Pingree, a worker-owned leather goods maker based in Detroit's new center, named after one of Detroit's legendary mayors. And today's episode from The Vault originally ran back in May, where my co-host Sven Gustafson and I visited their facility and learned about a different way to build a business. See, at Pingree, when there's profits, workers share 77 cents of each dollar, and their workers include formerly jobless veterans. This is your Daily Detroit for January 2nd, 2020. I'm Jer Stays. All of that right after we thank our members who make this show possible. In-depth stories like these require listener support to make happen. Sponsors often shy away from stories like these, so what you do matters. And thanks to our newest supporter, Steven. Consider joining us as a member at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. That's patreon.com slash daily Detroit. Now to the corner of Woodward and Milwaukee in Detroit, across from the Baltimore Q-Line station. I often like to start here. This is actually the very first concept that we started with. So when we're looking at, okay, we want to make shoes. You know, we, we haven't done it in Detroit since the 50s. What can it look like? What the silhouette look like? And so literally a duct tape pattern is where we started. And from there, we made our first prototype in 2015 in a, in a basement of Detroit. We had a bunch of equipment that was donated to us from Lear, and we had it in a couple different basements, in a church basement downtown at Central United Methodist Church. And we were in stuff at my house on the east side of Detroit. And, um, and we were like, okay, well, if, if we're going to make something, what kind of represents this resilience, kind of urban utility, something's going to last a really long time that, that we can hand make here in the city. And so this kind of led to almost four years later, um, the sneakers that just went live in October. Yeah. And so... These are oh, called the mayor, the right? The mayors, yes. Named after Hazen S. Pingree, <laughs> who was a veteran. He was a shoemaker. He was a three-term mayor of Detroit and was 24th governor of Michigan. Yeah. And so he kind of, to us, embodies this idea of what does service look like when you put the well-being of the people first in every aspect you can. Mm -hmm. So it looked like fighting political corruption, corporate corruption, breaking up monopolies, opening up all this land for folks to grow food on when there's a famine, just kind of cooperative, collective saying, let's let's actually put the people first for a change. And so I understand that the there's red shoelaces and, and kind of a red pull tab on the heel. Yes. That's that's intentional, I understand, right? It is. So it, it's two different aspects. So there's one, the fact that uh, the majority of the men and women on our team are, are veterans and those who have served, um, coupled with the fact that, um, so this kind of honors and pays homage to the service and sacrifice of the men and women who serve every single day, as well as uh, back in 1887, I think, um, Hazen S. Pingree Shoe Factory, because he was a shoemaker back way back in the day. Uh, it was all, almost burning to the ground and firemen saved his, his factory. And so he had this whole line of shoes with a red accent as a way to pay homage to the firefighters. And so although that company went out of business before he even became governor, we really were inspired to kind of lift up that exciting element as well as let people know that um, that we really honor our folks that 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 serve and keep our keep our country safe. So the the mayor launched in October just yesterday. We shipped our hundredth pair out to a customer. So we um, spent a, a long journey. It took us four years. We're a small team of eight, and we're a worker-owned company, which means seventy-seven cents of every dollar in profit is shared with all the workers. We we'll call it shoemaking studio. Just watch your head coming down. A lot of people would see Pingree Detroit. You're making, you know, frankly, kind of high-end shoes, leather products, handbags, clutch purses, things like that, and maybe mistake you for the other brand that's just block away from here, Shinola, right? But you guys are quite different in terms of your business model. Can you explain that a little bit? Because you guys have a very unusual kind of business structure. Sure. Yeah, so we kind of see ourselves as very community-rooted and, and worker-owned. So... The quality of the products we see is as competitive with any other folks who are making bags and, and footwear in the market. Mm -hmm. What makes us unique is that 
Um, it's the materials, it's the people, and it's the process. So the materials we use are all, it's brand new leather that was being used in the production of new car seats and steering wheels by the Detroit auto industry. And there's leftover leather in the process. Perfectly good, way too nice to be shipped over to China or landfilled. Mm -hmm. And so we've developed a relationship with them to insert ourselves into their kind of production process, get those remnant pieces, some is bought, some is donated, and actually use that to make, you know, our shoes, to make our bags, to make our clutches, to make the totes, to make the wallets. And the folks who actually make them are native Detroiters, lifelong Detroiters, new Detroiters, and U.S. veterans. Mm -hmm. So our core focus is creating living wage work, at teaching skilled trades, and creating support systems wrap around for men and women who are especially underserved and are overcoming a lot of adversity. And we, we are now a worker-owned company. So that means 77 cents of every dollar is shared with the workers on our team. Hmm. Interesting. And and you're a small team here, right? Like how many workers do you have now? Yeah, we are we are a team of eight. So we do a lot with a little. We wear many shoes, one could say. And uh, four of us are full-time, four are part-time. And so it's kind of a, a find a way, create the way. Um, and we're working towards both improving our, our processes so we can be more kind of kind of imagine a traditional factory model, but that also maximizes well-being. So the more people we can bring on and, and bring more equipment on, then we'll be able to improve how quickly we can make things. Right now, it's very bespoke. It's very handmade, but that's also, it's extremely therapeutic to work with your hands and make something that's intention on every step that you're putting the quality of craftsmanship in every stitch. Yeah. And you know it's gonna last a lifetime and it's handmade. The, like the footwear is almost exclusively made by US veterans on our team. Last a lifetime, how so? I've never heard of shoes last a lifetime. Yeah, so the beauty is when your soul wears out, uh, on your shoe, let me, let me be uh, uh -huh. clear. Uh, <laughs> you can bring it back to us, send it back to us. We'll even ship you a box and we resold that. Mm. So the uppers are, they're made to be in car seats that are meant to last decades. Those are on your feet, they get snug to your foot, it breaks in beautifully, and then we can just keep resoling it. We can patch it if we need to. It'll have some character 30 years from now, but you've still got a Detroit made product that's gonna last. Mm -hmm. We're designing products also to be kind of circular in the economy. So we want things to be closed loop in the cycle. We want to be completely waste free, toxic free, and carbon negative in the next five years. Your company, Pingree Detroit, is a few years old now. Talk to us about how you started this company. I mean, what happened? Where'd you get the idea to, to do this kind of unusual business model and everything? Sure. So it didn't start with the idea of, of making products. It started with the idea of how can we improve well-being for the people that we're connecting with. So in the same week, back in the fall of 2014, uh, I, I met a, a young man who was squatting my neighborhood in the Shawavoy Villages community on the east side. I, I'm lucky enough to know a lot of folks in the neighborhood, the elders, when we have potlucks, someone brings the elders a plate. Like everyone just knows each other and it's amazing. And there was this young man going in and out of the house, squatting. I went and talked to him, brought him a case of water and some stuff to make PBJs. It was like an abandoned home or yeah, something? Yeah, abandoned house. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, hey man, like, you know, how you doing? Like, what do you need? And he's like, you know, he let me know. He's like, I'm, I'm surviving. I'm trying to find work. And he turned out to be, he was a veteran. He'd been homeless in six months. Mm. And w w what was his story? Like, had he been deployed overseas or something? Yeah, he was home from Afghanistan. His name is Ryan. He was about my age, a couple years older. He had found work as a security guard. He couldn't find stable employment. He was living with his brother, his only family locally. And then his brother's wife kicked him out of the house because he kept waking her up at night. It's a story that made me extremely pissed off. And it didn't see, it didn't fit with my model of what I thought was reality. So I'd, I'd done work for Senator Carl Levin doing veterans affairs work, supporting veterans with their benefits. I was aware of the VA support systems and there's a lot of robust support systems, but there's tons of gaps. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't as aware of those gaps as I thought I was. And so me and this guy who was just trying to find an opportunity, he was fine surviving. He was surviving no problem in the house, but he couldn't find an opportunity. And so that was kind of this, you know, I literally gave him the, the 10 bucks I had in my wallet, gave him my phone number, said, I'm going to find a way to get you connected with some resources, you know, follow with me. And we did. But then that same week, I met another veteran who was also homeless, going door to door, trying to find work. Wow. This guy had a master's in engineering, was working through some addiction and was working through a lot of trauma, also had served overseas, couldn't find an opportunity. This guy, Michael, amazing human being, uh, we actually... I said out loud to him, like someone, like this is unacceptable, someone should do something about this. <laughs> and I said that out loud, just like I said the, the same night to my buddy Joe, like we need to do something about this. And so 
that day, this was kind of this moment of something's got to give, like this doesn't work. And so to explore what is the need, what can we create? What, what do we need to do to do something about this? Mm -hmm. And so we actually employed Michael. It was the first thing I was, I was working full time at the time doing work across the Midwest um, in leadership development. And so we actually employed Michael to do a listening campaign where he actually went and sat down with veterans, nonprofits, veterans, shelters, um, veterans who do a lot of work in the advocacy realm to see like, what are the needs? Yeah. What are the gaps? What are the problems? And, and what do veterans say they need? And so we identified that there's this gap between the provision of basic needs and living wage work. Mm -hmm. And what, what did he find out specifically about why veterans uh, have such a hard time finding work? There's a lot of different things. There's one that at times folks have a difficulty matching skills that they maybe had overseas, matching it with like civilian employment. There's a fact that a lot of jobs are this, this monotonous lack of meaning, just do what you're told and fit in. And it's like, if you've seen the world pull back and you know what's really going on, it's kind of hard to just fit in and just live in a, a monotonous, no meaning life when you've lived alongside people who would give their life to, to, to make sure you have yours. Mm. So to go from a purpose-driven structured environment to just free for all, I'm gonna step on your toes, I'm gonna push you down so I can get up, it's such a challenge. I, I would invite the audience to know that I would say veterans speak best for themselves and I'm known to say like, I know what veterans need. But I've had a lot of veterans tell me that there's been a challenge finding meaningful work um, and that there's such an opportunity. Some of these men and women have such capacity to lead and to be a part of team driven environments and, and they have such opportunities to give. And it's been a, a mix of having those opportunities presented to them, having just a, a access to know that they exist. And then the support systems along the way to make sure that they don't fall between the cracks. Mm -hmm. So that if, you know, they have a support system that, that you know, it's okay to let someone know you, you could use some support and, and to make those easily accessible and connect veterans to support other veterans. Yeah. So those are some, some of the few. And then you got to have stable housing if you need a job. You've got to have just some of those core basics figured out. And a lot of times even the basics aren't figured out. How is business going? Is, is Pingree Detroit profitable yet? Or are you inching closer to that? So we had our first profit month in December. We're still, um, we're still losing quite a bit of money on a day to day uh, as a, we're an L3C. We're a social impact company, which means our primary focus is mission coupled with being profitable, but we're, um, yeah, we're definitely surviving on, on loans and, um, donations and, uh, and, Stales are slowly picking up. You know, this hundredth pair of sneakers. The people are really moved by the the story, the impact. We just we're not in front of enough people yet. Mm -hmm. We're still trying to tell our story and doing it the bootstrapped way. So mm -hmm. I still don't pay myself. I bartend on Wednesdays to pay myself. My other owner doesn't pay himself yet. So it's the the, the people who need to be working are working right now. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of how can we strategically get in front of more folks, let them know what we're up to, mm -hmm. and also telling the story in an empowering way. Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily lift up the homelessness piece as much anymore because we want to make sure it's empowering to the team, the members that have, that are working through and. They're, they're in a very different situation than they might have been in the past. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that, uh, the business designation, the L3C. How does that um, differ from, you know, being a conventional company that's more focused on, you know, traditional profits and losses and things like that? I mean, does it, does it add challenges for you? Of course, yeah. So an L3C means that we're a social impact company. So our, our main purpose for existing is to fulfill the social mission which involves maximizing well-being, supporting veterans and Detroiters on our team, and we're actually a worker-owned company. Mm -hmm. And so uh, coupled with, yes, to be profitable, to stay afloat, to stay as a business, we have to make money and we have to be profitable, but it's a low profit. Mm -hmm. And so as an L3C, the challenges are doing things to where we're, we're not only looking how can we maximize profit, we're saying how can we maximize well-being? You know, okay, it's not treating people like machines. It's we sponsor float tank therapy for the veterans on our team where they're going and they're, they're working on their own mental health. And we, you know, have an hour paid lunch and we do yoga and meditation and we do leadership development. It's all around how can we actually create a support system for the men and women on our team. And then there's the piece around, um, so the veterans on our team once a month go to a veteran shelter one block away from us and support the veterans there. We do leather workshops, 
Sometimes it's a pizza party that they show up for. We'll make key change. We'll make goods. For the first hour, they make something for themselves, where the veterans in our team are doing that give back to the veterans there. And then the second hour, we actually pay them living wage to make something for us. And so we've actually hired veterans directly from that shelter to work with us. And within one year, they become a worker owner of our company. Mm -hmm. So that means you're literally and figuratively being a part of our success. You're owning the things you're making and you're a part of our innovation. So if anything you can see as a way to make something better, to do it better, to be more community focused, they have that agency and literal ownership to be a part of making that happen. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that you have uh, personally taken part in like Goldman Sachs training, business development training. So, I mean, I'm just curious, is there, do you hear pressure from people who say maybe like, hey, I'd love to invest in your company, but you know, I would do it only if you switched your business model. I mean, do you, do you hear those kinds of things? Like for sure. We, we've, probably gotten 50 no's from people from an investment side of things because either we're, we're too risky, we don't give them enough profit, or um, they want us to look at more at maximizing profitability and not so much the social mission. Like, well, the story's great if you sell some stuff. And so those just those aren't people we want to partner with anyways. We want to partner with folks who share our mission, share our vision for creating community level resilience. And so um, from a um, an investment standpoint from a Goldman Sachs perspective, um, those were conversations around how can we be as, as strategic as we can from a business perspective, making the best quality products, having the best interactions with customers, with partners we work with, with creating a kind of a whole system that that's designed around maximizing well-being. And so that training just helped me think a little bit differently from a business perspective because all my backgrounds in the nonprofit world. Mm. But it's a, there's a very different thing when you're producing a product to an end user versus producing a service for a certain audience. Mm -hmm. How are you selling uh, your products? Is it all strictly through the website or are you in like retail stores? Yes. Yeah, so right now in Detroit, we're in uh, the Good Neighbor Shop downtown. We're in Simplified Clothing Eastern Market. And we're also, if you ever go to my favorite coffee shop, Bottom Line Coffee, we have our wallets there. It's a black owned, Muslim owned business in uh, in. Uh, in well, that would be the Cass Corridor area. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're in a few stores in Port Huron and um, Grand Rapids. So we're kind of in different areas across Michigan, nine stores in total. We're also in the Somerset Collection, the Detroit shop, mm -hmm. we're there, but mostly we're online. So we're online at you know, P I N G R W -E Detroit, pingridetroit.com. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also at Easter Market every Saturday. I understand that you guys have um, established some uh, sales goals and everything for this year. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the biggest thing is we have a lot of men and women who want to work. We don't yet have demand for to bring on and employ. So the goals look like um, being profitable. Like we have our loans have gotten very from where they were. <laughs> we have a very small amount of cash to work with. So really being efficient in our processes. We want to be able to hire five more people in the next year mm -hmm. to do a variety of different elements. We're, we're I can't share it now, but there's some really exciting things when it comes to some of the footwear advancements we want to be participating in and some other kind of collaborations that we're looking at. Um, so that's kind of some of the growth goals is like growth and impacts, um, growth in product offerings. So people have been waiting for the governor's shoes for a long time. We're really excited to unveil those. We're really excited to offer some other products people have been waiting for. Um, and then it looks like just bringing in the money that's necessary to sustain the current team and to grow that team. What's your pitch to somebody who says, you know, wow, these are nice shoes, but you know, they're expensive. I mean, the, the mayor shoes I think are over $300, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, why are they worth it? I guess there's two pieces to it. The one is if the next time you bought a pair of sneakers, you were buying those that would look really good and last for the next 15 years, what would those be worth? You know, if you could resole your sneakers and then you, the fact that you knew that they are handmade by uh, hands of, of us veterans or Detroiters and that the leather was also supporting the Detroit auto industry. So those three elements, coupled with the fact that like 65% of the cost is just labor. So that you're paying a living wage, someone's making you know, 13 to, to $20 an hour handcrafting these products. Then the majority of all the hardware is American made. So you're supporting the, the rivets and the eyelets. You're coming from Louisiana. We've got the shoelaces are coming from Brooklyn, New York. The leather is destroyed. Like all those aspects are all done with a lot of intentionality. Mm -hmm. So you're not just buying a, uh, an expensive pair that's marked up. It's actually direct to customer. We don't currently have the retail locations for our sneakers because right now it's pretty much the cost to make it. And then there's a small margin on top. 
Jared and I know a little bit about the struggles of trying to launch, you know, your own business and and get it to fly and everything. I mean, you're, you're describing, you know, it's difficult. You're not drawing a paycheck. You're you're bartending once a week and everything. But I mean, are you optimistic that this is, you're in it for the long haul and you feel good about this? Hundred percent. Every day, uh, I start off the day visioning what we're going to create and what the impact is that we're able to create. So I'm hundred percent optimistic. I believe in my entire being that what we're able to accomplish is going to be hundreds of jobs uh, across the country, but starting in Detroit, Michigan, that are living wage jobs that are worker owned, which means that equity is the core of what we do, that well-being is maximized in all fronts, that we're going to be able to not only produce things that are a little bit of a more accessible price point as we grow and have more equipment and have more scale, but that we also are producing things that people need that are sustainable, that have a closed loop cycle so that we don't have to throw stuff away, wears away, right? We create things that last, that are made with care, that are supporting people like Nate and other makers on our team so that we can all together thrive and we can create together a Detroit that actually works for Detroiters, that makes our neighborhood stronger and that actually maximizes well-being. Before I let you go, don't forget that we do this every single day. And if you like what we're doing, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people when they find the show know that it's something they want to make part of their day. With that, I'm Jer Stays. Thanks for listening. Take care of each other and let's make a better Detroit together.